May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week, I that we we can. Seems like a simple and straightforward approach to following Jesus. Have faith and do what we can. Do what we can, maybe not what Jesus can do. I mean, we saw last week that Jesus did some pretty amazing things. He healed the woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years, and he, he raised a young girl from death, raised her back to life. Now, I can't do that. <laughs> I don't think we're expected to. We're not expected to do all that Jesus does, but we can do what we can. Sometimes that means, means that we feed people. We like to do that around here. Sometimes that means that we provide sanctuary for those who need a place to stay, like when we host a camp on our property. Sometimes that means that we provide a worship space for religious refugees. And that's what we're doing starting today with the Peace Gospel Mission. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. <clears throat> this week, though, this week, Jesus didn't seem to be able to do much, right? He goes to his hometown. He, now, he starts out in Capernaum, okay? Uh, the, the, the town where he calls the, the disciples, where he meets Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John. They all live in Capernaum. And now they come back to the nearby village of Nazareth. And it's the Sabbath, and he goes into the temple, and he begins to teach and they've probably heard a little bit about this guy. They're, they're, they're wondering what he will say, but then he gets up there and he's just Jesus. The kid, right? The one that grew up down the street, um, who's the eldest son of Mary and has all of these brothers and sisters, Joseph and James and, and Judas, and, and their sisters are all here too. And wait a minute, isn't he the one that left and, and went over the He's been hanging out in Capernaum with his no good friends instead of taking care of his mother. And they're offended. Who is this to speak wisdom to us? Who is this to talk about the kingdom of God? They just can't imagine it. How can the, the punk, the kid from down the street, suddenly be a prophet? He's amazed at their lack of trust. He's amazed at their lack of faith, and he could do no deed of power in that place. Do you ever wonder why? Now, it probably has something to do with faith, but it's not just faith. It's more complicated than that. Remember, the, there are people who come to Jesus, and there is no sign of faith, and there is no talk of faith, and they are healed anyway. But the woman who suffered from hemorrhages had so much faith that she knew that if she could just touch his cloak, she would be healed. So maybe it does have something to do with faith. Maybe it has something to do with the importance of our engaging with Christ when Christ shows up in our midst. And if we don't engage, if we reject and turn away, well, not as much can be done for us. A few might be healed, but that's it. Jesus is rejecting his hometown. And you've all been rejected before. You've all tried to convey something and had it just fall flat. You've all tried to lead and had people not follow. You've all tried to accomplish something and had it just not work out. It's part of the human experience. If you try, you're going to fail. Here's Jesus facing rejection. And what does he do? He withdrew from Nazareth and began to preach in the surrounding towns and villages. He moved on. And he took the disciples who he had called, and he sent them two by two to the other villages. Now, Keep in mind, he's just been rejected in his own town. It did not go well, and he's sending them out to do what he's doing. 
Can you imagine they might have been just a little bit nervous about that, maybe even a little bit um, reluctant? So he sends them out two by two, and out they go. He was rejected, he withdrew, and he prayed, and then he went out and he just kept preaching the gospel. Three weeks ago, I met Pastor Solomon Gebramesco. Uh, Solomon is a religious refugee from Eritrea. Uh, Solomon, of course, means peace. And in Tigrinya, which is his language, Gebramesco means he who follows the cross. And when he explained this to me, I said to him, well, your, your parents must really have wanted you to be a pastor. His middle name means something else, like it's tackle, but I can't remember what it meant. But it's something like that, right? So peace, holy man, follower of the cross, right? It, it, it was inevitable that Solomon would become a pastor. And he is the pastor of a group of Eritrean refugees that have been worshiping with the Joybringers Church just down the street from us. Now, Joybringers is mostly um, west, northwest uh, African uh, folks, um, most of them re religious refugees, and but they're from all different countries and they speak lots of different languages. So there's a group of them from Eritrea and they're led by Pastor Gabriel Meskel in their language, Tigrinya, and they call themselves the Peace Gospel Mission. And Last Sunday, a week ago, was their last day that they had a place to worship. Because sometime in the next week or so, that whole building, that whole complex at the Westminster Community Church, which is just at the corner here at where Westminster and, and Greenwood and 145th come together, it's going to be torn down. They're knocking the whole thing down. They're going to put up apartments or something along those lines. Real estate. So he came to me and he said, we don't have any place to worship. Is there any chance that we could borrow some space from you? And I said, I, I don't know, but come on over tomorrow and we'll talk about it. We'll see if we can figure something out. And he came over and I was impressed. I thought this is, this is a really interesting person and a good person. And I'd like to see if there's some way that we can help his little group of Eritrean religious refugees. And so I took it to the vestry and the vestry said, yeah, let's, let's see if we can do something for them. At the very least, let's give them 90 days respite so they can come here for the next 90 days, and we'll use that time to figure out if this is a relationship that we can make work for the long term, if they can use our space in the long term. And so I called them and, and invited them to come and begin worshiping here. And they invited me, immediately they invited me to come to their last service which was June 27th at Westminster. And it wasn't just any service, it was a wedding. <laughs> wow, it was so exciting. I mean, we walked in and I was immediately just sort of overwhelmed that many of the women were wearing these beautiful traditional dresses that have, um, they're all white, and then they have some bright floral pattern down the center, and usually in a cross shape, there's another piece across that's in that same floral pattern, and they had these wonderful, beautiful um, uh, 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 arrangements of their hair with, with crowns in them, some of them. They must have been like the mother of the bride or somebody important, I don't know, I didn't figure it out. And so we came in and they sat us down at a table and the service began, and the whole thing was in Tigrinya, um, which apparently, if you speak Arabic, you can sort of get it, it's close. Um, but the other women at the table with us, uh, they looked over and they said, do you understand any of this? And I said, no. And they said, we don't either. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you have a community full of uh, refugees from different countries. And so they're all there together to celebrate this wedding. Um, but they don't even all speak the same language. Um, it, it was beautiful. and. At the end of the, the ceremony portion of the service, which let me tell you, it went on for a while. The sermon, I joke that to, to, to couples that I'm only going to preach for about 40 minutes. Solomon did preach <laughs> for 40 minutes, at least. 
So at the end of all that, he invited me to come up and give a blessing to the couple, which I was honored. And I had some warning, thank God. I had some warning that he was going to do this. So I went forward and I spoke the final blessing that we speak at a marriage ceremony um, out of our prayer book. And it was a beautiful and, and wonderful experience. And when I finished, there, there were uh, people yelling amen and alleluia and drums rolling and people ululating, you know, oh, that, that beautiful singing of the, the ululation that the, the women did. And I can't do it, but I think you know what I mean. It was a great experience. And yet, there I was. I was with Alice, my wife, and my mother-in-law, Joan, and um, uh, I felt a little awkward. I didn't know anybody, and fortunately, the other women at the table where we were seated, were, they spoke English, so that was nice. But then I felt a little awkward, and so I thought, well, you know, as, the, as we transition from ceremony to meal, we'll just exit quietly out the back door and go get some dinner and go home, have our normal Sunday evening. And we got up and we started to move and immediately we were surrounded. Oh, no, 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 you are not leaving. They insisted that we stay and oh my gosh, the food was amazing. It was out of this world delicious. And I was really grateful that we did stay. Um, and I had a wonderful conversation with Pastor Solomon. He was very generous with his time as I sat there Sometimes we need to accept hospitality from others. And I think that's one of the things that we see in the gospel reading today. Jesus sends them out without provision. He sends them out without a money belt, right? Without a bag of money on their belt, without food in their bags. They are to depend on the hospitality of those to whom they reach. Sometimes that's a part of our call when we are called to follow Jesus. So Tuesday, Solomon and I uh, visited again and, and spoke for a good two hours, and he talked about why he was a religious refugee and how it's illegal in Eritrea and in Ethiopia to be a Christian unless you're one of the official um, uh, accepted denominations, and, and there's only two. One of them is the Ethiopian Coptic Church, the or Coptic Orthodox Church, the other is the Roman Catholic Church. But the Roman Catholics aren't allowed to, they're, you're allowed to be Roman Catholic, but you can't worship because they, uh, it, it just didn't work out with the government. So it's illegal to gather with more than two or three people in a house as Christians. If you are seen with three or four or five people gathering together and praying, you can be arrested, you can be beaten. You know, it's, it's a serious crime. And so they come up with ways to share their faith and to pray together um, secretly. There's a, um, there's a coffee ritual in Ethiopia and Eritrea called the Boon Coffee Ritual. And it's, you know, maybe something like the tea ritual in Japan. It's like two hours long, you know, it involves a ritual where you boil the water and you make the coffee and you. You do all of these things, and it takes a good two hours, two, two to three hours to get through it. And so they hold a boon ritual and invite one person to their house. And they sit there with that one person, and he might be a teacher, and he brings a Bible, and they read together, and they study. And if anyone shows up, they close the Bible, put it under the table, and just hold their coffee cups. We're not, we're not praying. We're just having coffee. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if your faith were as restricted as that? Can you imagine if you had to hide your prayer and hide that you cared for others? Today is Independence Day. Today we celebrate our independence and one of the great benefits we have as residents, as, as citizens of this country is that we can pray. We can gather here with I think there's probably 40 of us in here right now. And there's, there's no one going to come breaking through the door and arresting us. Which is good, because it's going to be the priest that goes first. So. <laughs> <laughs> the peace gospel mission um, 
take this to their name because they preach peace. And that seems like a nice thing to you and me. We believe in peace. But what if for generations your family has been conscripted into the war of independence between Eritrea and Ethiopia? And if you've been reading the newspapers in the last week, you hear about the Tigray rebels in Ethiopia that are rising up and trying to take over the country. Well, the Tigray clan or tribe used to be in charge of all of Ethiopia, and they were the ones that refused the independence of Eritrea. And so Eritrea has come together with the government of Ethiopia to fight the Tigray, and it's just, it's a terrible mess. It's a terrible, terrible people are dying of hunger and starvation, people are dying from war. I mean, it's a terrible mess there right now. For generations, this has been going on. It took 30 years for Eritrea to win its independence. Solomon told me stories of you know, his aunts and uncles, there are five of them, and of the five, two have died because of the war for independence. And there's another family in his home village where a woman sent seven of her children away and all seven of them died in the war, right? And now the war continues as the Tigray rise up again and try and take over. So this is the setting that he's leading a congregation in. This is the setting that they're preaching, love your enemies. Can you see how love your enemies is a nice idea when your enemies aren't killing your children, or your aunts and uncles, or your brothers and sisters, or your neighbors. It's hard. It's hard. This the government in Eritrea has a reputation of being one of the most repressive in the world. It's an Islamic government. They, you know, they, they're really serious about not allowing Christian gatherings. So the Bible study that Solomon has been leading has been reading Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. I didn't bring it with me, but it's the part where Paul says, be subject to your governors. Be subject to the government. Don't make trouble. Imagine how challenging that would be to Eritrean refugees. Jesus sent the disciples out to share a message of peace and love. And he sent them out in first century Palestine, where there were Roman overlords and tax collectors who were Jews who were betraying their own people to gather uh, wealth for the Romans. Um, there were people being crucified on the roads in and out of Jerusalem on a regular basis. That kind of struggle exists today. That struggle to preach peace in the face of hatred and murder is going on today. That's what Jesus sent the disciples out two by two into. It was a world like the world of Solomon and the people of peace gospel mission. And he sent them out knowing that they would face rejection, just as he did in his hometown. And he says to them, if any will not accept your message as you leave, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And, you know, you'll read in, in Bible commentaries or in, in, you know, things written about this, that this is some kind of grand curse, right? Shake the dust off your shoes as if it was like some kind of voodoo uh, evil eye that you were gonna put upon them and they would really suffer from that. But to me, it reads more like, move on, give the message to someone who can hear it. Just shake the dust off and move on. Just keep going. And isn't that what Jesus did in his hometown? He gets rejected and he just moves on. He goes on, goes to the next town. All right, they don't, they're not ready to hear it here. Let's see if we can share this message in the next town. And the gospel message is life-giving. Faith leads to salvation. 
And, and salvation is to be freed from fear. Freed from the fear that stops us from, from loving and from being generous. Freed from the fear that surrounds us in life. This is a fearful world and a fearful life that we live. Fear is ever present. And we live good lives. We live in America where we can worship. I don't have any children who have been killed in war. I don't have any aunts and uncles. Well, I actually have some aunts and uncles that died in Vietnam and Korea. But, you know, I mean, it's not the same. It's not to the same level. Life is a fearful thing. And the struggles and dangers of this life can fill us with fear, even in a safe place, a relatively safe place, comparatively like the one that we live in. We are in this together. We're in this world together. We declared it so when we were baptized. You make it so by showing up here today. We're in this together. Our faith is something that we do. Our faith is, is active. It's, it's giving, it's a commitment that we make to trust in Christ and to follow Christ and to go where we are sent, even in the face of rejection. And when we are rejected, shake the dust off and move on. Even in Eritrea, where faith is illegal, they gather for a boon coffee ritual and secretly say prayers and read scripture. Even in Ethiopia, where families have been torn apart by years of conflict, and the conflict goes on as the same people try to take power back again, we can live for peace and participate in love, the love and caring of God, and doing the hard work of loving our enemies, even our enemies. Even when we are homeless, or when we see the scourge of economic injustice surrounding us. I mean, how you drive around our, our, our towns and our cities today and there's, there's encampments everywhere. Even just three years ago, that wasn't true. There are homeless encampments everywhere now. And they're not all sanctioned like this one with porta potties and garbage collection. I mean, it's a real struggle out there. We come together in faith and we do what we can. We work for social justice. We work towards economic justice. We host sanctioned camps when we can. Even when we are hungry or when we see that our neighbors are hungry, we come together in faith and we do what we can. Last week I said, have faith and do what you can. But really it's something we do together. We come together in faith like this and do what we can with our feeding program and our care teams, with all the various ministries that God inspires us to. We're in this together, not as benefactors, not as the great savior that's gonna bring God to other people, but as people who are in the midst of a fearful world, just like our brothers and sisters, we come together in faith and we do what we can. Even when we don't know how to share our faith with others in this secular and cynical world, we come together and we do what we can. Share what you love. Tell your story. Share what you hope for. Share the blessing of having faith, of being together and of doing what we can together. Because when we do this, we experience life more abundant. When we come together like this in the face of fear and we challenge the fear with our faith and just do what we can together, it fills us with hope. We can see a different future for ourselves and for our neighbors. This week we'll have a picnic after this service and uh, we invited the members of Camp United We Stand to come and, you know, every time we have a camp here, we have to go through a permitting process. And part of that process 
if we, we send a letter to everyone who lives within 500 yards or something like that of the church and tell them that we're having a public meeting where they can come and ask their questions about the process of hosting a camp here. So I took that same mailing list and I mailed them invitations to the picnic. I hope they come. Wouldn't it be nice to get that invitation instead of, well, there's gonna be another camp in your neighborhood. I don't know how you feel about that, but I hope you'll support us. So this time we're inviting them to have a picnic with us. I also invited the members of the Peace Gospel Mission, our Eritrean brothers and sisters to come. And I was assured that there, it's, I think it's just gonna be their elders. Five of them will come and they will meet us and, and we'll start to get to know each other a little bit. Um, and their first service will be right here this afternoon at about three o'clock. And of course, I've invited all of you. We've invited all of you to come and to stay for a picnic. And they've been cooking and preparing since yesterday. Uh, there were big platters of delicious looking ribs coming out of the oven as I arrived this morning. There's some really good food out there for you. So in this case, we're gonna to come together and do what we can to eat some delicious food. <laughs>